What is up, everybody? Jim to my right, Mr. Ryan Muckenhern across from us. Uh, you know, red dots on an AR. Nothing surprising there. Well, you put a red dot on your turkey gun. That's starting to make a lot of sense, gaining some steam. But a red dot on your hunting rifle? No. Never. Bolt action hunting rifle, to be sure. A lot oh of people my. are hunting with their ARs now. Well, this is true. So that there you go there. But do they have a red dot on their AR when they're doing that? Yeah. I've s- I synced it. Yep. You synced it. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Well, Just the bolt gun, though, is still like the oddity. Okay, the bolt gun, the oddity. But that's what we're going to talk today. Mm-hmm. Talk about today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is that maybe it shouldn't be such Mm-mm. an oddity. And maybe it just seems like an oddity here in the good old USA. Mm, Mark, I like where mm, your head's at. Yeah. Because it's not other places Mm-mm. internationally. For I'd say maybe some specific styles of hunting. Sure. The first. Let's talk about that. The first time I ever saw an optic come back for the VIP warranty that came back because of an explosion was a rifle that exploded, a bolt-action rifle, and there was a Spark II on top that came back. And um, the, oh, what, what that little control panel that was off on the side yep. of the Spark II had, like, come loose. It really wasn't all that, all that traumatic. Dangling. Dangling a little bit, yeah, it, it, but it still functioned. It was just, you know, kind of, uh, but it came back, and I remember that he explained what firearm it was on, and I had to ask some guys around the office, this, is this normal? What was this guy doing? Was he, like, testing the red dot by putting it on, like, a bolt? And they went, no? No, that's normal over there. He was from somewhere in Europe. Okay. It's very interesting. Oh, yeah. I knew there's something about this. Some people do this. Red dots on bolt rifles, as European as the Speedo. Now it is, yeah, it's officially the Speedo of gun setups now. Did wow. I ruin it? Now that you said it. No, I... It's different. I would say my interest level hasn't changed. Okay. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> we went from peaked to more. Because I, I, I said it, and I kind of ruined it for me. Uh, Mark, it was a bold strategy. Let's see if we can bring it back. Yeah. Um, so, as Mark alluded to, actually quite popular on the European continent and elsewhere, too. Um, got some good friends in... Africa that use them, uh, especially on dangerous game guns. Uh, sure. You know, big doubles or big bolt guns uh, where they'll, they'll put a small, you know, two MOA dot up front. Uh, of course, the idea here and precedence here is speed and accuracy mm-hmm. under duress um, in the case of the dangerous game gun. For my European friends, market alluded to styles of hunting in which these things would be conducive for success. And that would be like a driven hunt. Yep. Very where, common. Yeah. Where you could be on stand. And either using uh, pushers or dogs, running, you know, things like red deer, roe deer, and hogs, and running them past the shooter on stand. Or, and you'll see this a lot in, in like parts of Scandinavia, where they'll use hounds and they'll they'll like run moose or red deer. Right, I've uh, heard of that, like in Sweden. Yep. Yep. And we're we're generally shooting pretty close distances, and we generally have very limited window of opportunity to execute a shot. Mm-hmm. Sounds a lot like northern Wisconsin. During hunting white, <laughs> hunt white tailed deer. So here, here's a cool thing. Uh, a couple months ago, I was in Massachusetts at a really neat trade show called Huntstock and talked to a whole smattering of folks up there that have adopted a hunting style called tracking. Sure. In which, with a little bit of snow on the ground, you go out and you cut a fresh deer track and you follow that track until you turn up the deer. And it's generally a pretty quick affair. Like, you get to the track, whoop, up stands your deer, you take your shot. They're also doing driven hunts, like traditional drives. We we don't call them driven hunts here. We just call them drives, deer drives. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they're in heavy cover. You know, they've got almost like this boreal forest situation going on in, in parts of the, you know, northeast. So we're talking 50 yards or less, and sometimes less than that, like 25 yards or less. And we've got to be quick, and we've got to be accurate. Oftentimes a moving shot. Yep. And something that surprised me, and this is going to sound ageist, I guess, is I had an older generation of shooters who were running guns like Remington 760s, 7600s, Browning BARs, handful of lever guns, but, but mostly high caliber center fires in either a slide or a semi-auto, who were coming over looking for red dots. Mm-hmm. 
And I thought, this is fantastic. You know, guys that were like older than my dad saying like, that is the answer for what we're doing. Do you think part of that, well, okay, so I could see this going two ways. Yeah. Get a little bit older, your eyes start to age. Maybe you could not pick up a red dot as well, or maybe in some cases that is what you pick up better. Sure. Yeah. I would say you'd probably pick up the red dot way faster. Yeah. Yeah. Right? But then like a traditional, like even iron. like a heavy duplex ready, a oh, reticle yeah. or irons or. They expressed to me the, the reasoning behind it for the selection was lack of like non-existent magnification. Mm-hmm. They wanted gun up on target, pull the trigger. They wanted a brilliant aiming solution right at the middle of their center, find their critter, take the shot. Yep. I mean, I think about it this way. You know, like you're talking, you're talking about a, a driven hunt, mm-hmm. you know, in Europe, uh, a whitetail deer drive in good old Wisconsin. Yep. Uh, you know, maybe uh, maybe you're calling uh, stags in France, thick, close quarters shooting like that. But like when you think of a red dot, traditionally on an AR, it's like, oh man, uh, close quarters, uh, fast target acquisition, dynamic situation, all these Hunting situations that we're describing yeah. are all of those things, yeah. and you need those exact same attributes that you need in a tactical environment. While still maintaining accuracy. While maintaining accuracy, yeah. yes. And I think maybe here, the notion of one of those sights being placed on a traditional hunting rifle, and so by that I'm thinking like bolt action 308, bolt action odd 6, 270, is that somehow those little dots are not accurate. That is not the case uh, at all. So mounted properly... And the right dot, especially if you pick one that's bright but smaller mm-hmm. in, in diameter, like the MOA size of the dot, you can still shoot to the rifle's accuracy ability, like without question. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, if, 100%. If you're steady and, and you bring that thing back to the same spot. And to pick a cool story, we got to turn the clock way back. Um, NPD had given me a prototype Spark Solar. This is years before we came out with it. They said, play with this and just let me know what you think. So I was like, oh, cool. Um, and I had a bolt action Savage 308 that I was using for all the range shirts. And I mounted that thing up on there. And I, I was out at, uh, at that outdoor range we used to do all the range shirt on. And so they've got a 50, a 75, like 400 yard plates and a 150 and a 200. So I topped off that big AICS mag and just started going to town. And as fast as I could run the bolt from 50, 75, 100, 150, 200, ding, 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 all the way out there, dot on target and shoot. And I had a 50-yard zero on it. And it was like the most practical and quickest I've ever run a bolt gun accurately. Yep. And, and it was just too simple. And it's interesting, you know, I mean, and, and you know me, I'm a, a fan of magnification. Sure. Now, you guys like to uh, take some... Uh, liberties with how much magnification i like a three to 15 or a three is like my sweet spot a three to 15 i'll say it's my sweet spot what about all those times you take the four and a half to 22 out not as much as the three to 15 anyway where i'm going with this though is um i can see where the situation that you're talking about ryan if you're primarily in a region where your max shooting distance would be about 200 yards, most of your stuff inside of that, and oftentimes the situations like we just described, a red dot is going to be the optimal tool for oh, that job. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And I think aside from the, the thought that that system will somehow not be accurate, I also think there's a big fear of missing out component to this where folks will – look at the two on paper and be like, well, I won't be able to, to see what I'm trying to shoot necessarily. Right. Just because of lack of magnification. Well, how do I know if there's not brush in my way? Well, if you've ever looked at something under the load of magnification, especially when you've got brush close up, you just don't see the brush. Nope. No, you look right through it. I think a lot of people, especially in optics, maybe other things too, but in optics I've seen a lot of people make snap judgments looking through an optic in a completely different context and place than they'll actually be looking through it when they're trying to use it. No doubt. So, I mean, one classic example is people who pull out a red dot out of the box and they're in their dimly lit bedroom and they're very excited. They haven't even put it on the gun yet and they hold it out 
and they say it's hard to get behind and there's a ton of red light everywhere and it's like okay you jack the brightness up all the way and you're holding it in your hand and your hand is moving all over the place and you don't have a consistent cheek well or anything like that and they make a snapshot judgment there and then when people go to the range and they have a red dot and say they're trying to do which i think 50 yard zero would be better but say they're trying to do the old classic 100 yard zero with one and they're looking at a target and they're like I just can't see the bullseye, you know, yeah. that's the size of a nickel a yeah. hundred yards away. Yeah. And then they get all frustrated like they won't be able to see their target. And you know, then you but when you actually put it into context, like a situation you described with the steel targets you're shooting at, even if those were eight inch pieces of steel, which is basically vital zone of a deer. Vital zone of a deer. Yeah. If those are eight inch pieces of steel. Like, the thing is, you're not paying attention to a bullseye on it the size of a nickel. You're paying attention to just hitting the steel. Yep. And when you can run it that fast, and the steel doesn't disappear, you can see it plain as day, boom, just dot on the thing, pull trigger. Yep. It, it becomes so much easier when you actually put stuff into context. Yeah. And we can go into all, you know, binoculars, people look at out of context all the time, spotting scopes, other rifle scopes. I mean, people do it all the time, but, like, red dots, absolutely that way. And, it, you know, it is interesting because that, that same, like, or rather the opposite thought process with them on an AR occurs. It's like the perfect marriage. Yeah. And like, that's the quizzical part to me. Like I'll put it on this system. That's also hyper accurate and super functional and I'll play ball with it to 300 yards. Right. Cause if you gave someone an AR and you're like, here's a three to 15, they'd be like, Oh, Whoa, it's too much. Yes. I, I don't want to look up, you know, uh, Nat's ass or anything like that with this thing. I'm trying to, I'm trying to be fast. Yes. And you're like, Okay, got it. So here's the perfect optic for that. And then you take that same optic, put it on a different gun for the same basic concept. Yep. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. Not enough. Yeah. Not precise enough. I, I can't mean, I can't see enough. I'll de- <laughs> I'll defend my life with it. Yeah. But it's uh, for hunting, it's not yeah. precise enough. Yeah. No, it's it's a super interesting concept and I think it's a very, very, very valid one. And obviously our friends in Europe and places like South Africa, for instance prove that every year Mm -hmm. right there's untold sums of videos out there guys and gals uh, on the european continent doing any kind of big game hunting and it's not it's not even out of the norm to see some very beautiful blazer or sour or right kriegoff rifle you know exquisite gun with a small dot on top of it which is and when i look at that it's just because i'm not used to that when i see Mm -hmm. that i'm like gosh that kind of looks out of place but i bet it works really well yeah. Well, and that and that could be a large part of it. It's just that around here we're not used to seeing that. And it, it you take something that you're like tactical. Look at the guy on the wall behind you. He's got a red dot on an AR. And you take that and you're like transposing it onto something that you see as like uh, a family heirloom or you know sure. old school classic. And and it it can mess with your head a little bit. But when you really boil it down to the the practicality. Mm-hmm. It may not be the silhouette you were going for. But golly, does it work. Golly, does it work. And I'll tell you what is more classic than just the outline of a firearm is a photo with a bunch of deer hanging from a basketball hoop or something like that at deer camp. <laughs> uh, that's classic right there. I don't know if I've ever seen a basketball hoop. Oh, I've hung more than one deer off Have a basketball. Really? Oh, yeah. Now that you say it, it's perfect. We had one when we were kids that you had to put like a broomstick in and then yeah. you pushed it up. Wouldn't that be slick? Like that thing comes down to well, like, and now kids basically get a little wind up yeah. on it, you know, so you can just lower it down, hang the deer up, and wind it up. They they come down to like four feet, yeah. so if you had a gambrel on there, you just hook that thing up and then just oh, I never thought about bingo. doing that. Golly, how do you get Cr- it up there? Crystal's parents have a um, like a free uh, freestanding basketball hoop, like it's not oh, attached yeah. to the house; yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like on a on a pole. Yeah, just uh, just put it in a, a gambrel, and then like somebody. You know, give a good little hoist one person, the other one pulls, and you just tie it off. Oh, That's sure. how we've done it. Sure. I didn't even have, like, a pulley system. You know. Um, here's what I'm, I'm going to say one more thing, though. Yeah. Originally, like, yeah, red dots on ARs, right? And then, then we start to see them on turkey shotguns. Yeah. Yeah. Now we see them very, 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 very commonly on pistols. Oh, yeah. Carry guns. And at least for us on this side of the pond... Now they're infiltrating our nice bolt guns. <laughs> they're as, everywhere. As they should. As they should. I think it's an awesome idea. What gun of yours would you put one on? Oh, 16-inch Tika. That's what I was thinking. Zero percent chance of uh, disappointment with that. Well, that's another thing, though. We've talked about this before on the yeah. podcast that people don't do a lot of over here yet is 16-inch bolt guns. Sure. 
16 Cuz I will short. say like we, the 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 application when you're thinking about like a 26 inch barrel bolt gun yeah. and then you put a red dot on that now you're talking about things that like practically collide you know what I mean cuz you're not going to be stalking around in the woods you know putting your gun on the ground and crawling around or moving around a, to- a whole lot with a bolt gun like that so if you put a red dot on that I could see how it would be a little bit odd yeah but, you know, get anything between that 16 and 20 inch where it's more handy, lightweight, and not so pole vaulty. Yeah. Yeah. Even, even you know, okay, so let's look at a couple of guns that appear to be match made in heaven. 16 inch bolt guns. No sweat. Guns like the Browning BLR. No sweat. Guns like the Browning BAR. No sweat. 7600, 760s, 742s, 7400s, 740s. Any of those fast acting Hmm. Quick relief rifles. See what I did there? It's fast, fast acting, quick relief. Oh, I was talking yeah. about a gun, not God, medicine. I was a little slow on the uptake there. Okay, but so it was like a medicine reference yeah. for guns. Fast acting, quick Apply relief. directly to the forehead. Yeah. No. Of a deer. Mm. I think I'm going to put... Bit of a hot topic. I think I'm going to put one on, uh, on my Tika for doe season. You know, you were reading my mind. It's almost like we need to go do some driven... Doe hunts. Say less. You can get a mount specifically for the Crossfire Red Dot to tie right into a Tika T3. I'll put one on the old BAR. Oh, a direct mount? Yeah. That's nice. It's right there. You can not, the strike, Tika. not the Strike Fire. Not feeling that one? Strike Fire is great. Ooh, a crossfire. Like, Here's what I love about the Crossfire for hunting optic. Yes. Analog control. I, I know what you're saying. Yep. Fair. Just reach up. Boop, boop. Big gloved hand. Think you got those um, glomets. You know those? Yeah. Those Hit that, no sweat. Fair. Not fishing for a little button. I Buttons like it. aren't that small on them. It just it Strike. fits better in here. I get it. Yeah. I get it. I think, Simple I think that would be Simple the beans. Mind. And you know what else I can think of? I can think of a white-tailed deer walking at 220 yards across an ag field, knowing that I have a 50-yard zero on that gun, and I'm not really worried about like impactful drop until I get to about that 200-yard line, mm-hmm. knowing that I'm only having to hold high shoulder to make a vital hit, I feel like I'm missing that. You just don't have to think about anything. I feel like I'm missing anything. It's easy. Dot on target and pull the trigger, just like it always was with ARs. Red dots allow you to think less. Yeah. And so I when you pull important. up a rifle scope and you got a reticle, and then you, like sometimes, you know, maybe not in the heat of the moment, but maybe in the heat of the moment, you pull up a rifle scope and you're like, center cross here. But then you're like, oh, I do have a hold over it. Could... Center cross. No, but I could... Dot on target and go. Yeah, it's with a dot. You don't. You're like, all I got's a dot. I'm put it where I'm yep. pretty sure it's gonna work, and it probably will. I'm doing it. You would do the 16 inch Tika. Yep. With a suppressor. Oh yeah. Yeah, naturally. The Jim, you've got the BLR 308. Yeah, I could do that. And that's threaded, right? No, I actually should thread it. I thought that was threaded. Mm-mm. No, it's mm. not. Interesting. I should though. Very accurate. And then um, I'll fire up the old BAR and we'll go beat the brush. I like this. That would be fun. Yeah. Well, the good news is we've talked ourselves into going hunting together, so I like that. Uh, That's been a while. That's a win. Um, Holiday hunt. Yeah, we'll do something like that. Mm. That'd be fun. Go shoot as a mess of white tail does. I'm in. I like that. Did we? Other than (laughs) making plans for later this year. Anything else we should cover on the validity of red dots on, I'd say, you know, your bolt gun? Sure. Um, one note. So things like the Crossfire red dot, as well as the Spark Solar, come in the box with a low and high mount. This would be paired best with the low mount. Very good to point out. On a, on a traditional hunting rifle. Mm-hmm. Um, what's cool about this is the presentation of that optic will be lower than it would be with a, like a standard rifle scope paired with a set of rings and a Picatinny rail. So I think that does a lot for comfort. And if we look at how, and you've heard me harp harp about this before, modern rifles are still stocked as if they should have iron sights. Mm -hmm. They are perfect with a red dot on them. That's that's true. That's a good point. Perfect. And that parallax-free anywhere. I mean, remember that place we went on the holiday hunt? Mm Mm-hmm. We walked through all them pine trees. Were you there on that one? I was. Yeah. I had my... (laughs) I had my BLR? Vepper. Oh, that's right. I had an AK that looked that's like right. a dragon off. So <laughs> don't see that every day. God, this was about as Wisconsin as I, I remember. Could get. I got out there. I'm like, God, it's classic gym. <laughs> that so that 
pine plantation that we were on, could you imagine deer running through there, how fast you could pick that deer up and accurately target and shoot one? Yep. It'd be perfect. Very exciting. Yes. Oh, can I? Okay, I'm going to make it go long. Or then it already has. We're 10 seconds over. It's pretty good for us. No, that's t- you were 10 minutes and 10 seconds over. It says 10 on the screen, Jim. Okay. Uh, <laughs> low power variables yep. at one power. Yep. I've got one on the Tika right now. Oh, you do? It's going to Wyoming. <laughs> so, like, talk talk to me real quick. I think, I think we got it because someone's going to be sure. wondering this. The difference between a red dot by itself mm-hmm. and a, a low power variable. Sure. Which has one power, but then it can also zoom in if if you need to. Yeah. <laughs> like, explain the situation where you would want the red dot and then the situation where you want the low power variable. Because sure. I don't think that... Like, we've had conversations before where we're like, oh, the low power variable is just so good nowadays. Yep. But the red dot is still, is still around and it's still probably going to be around forever. So here's a re- relatable analog, I suppose. Um, and we run into this when we're on the range. We're doing like, Intro to carbine, carbine one, two, three. You are still ever so slightly faster with a red dot because nothing is like n- no part of your image is necessarily translated like it is when it's coming through even a, a really good LPVO like a Razor one to six, which has just an amazing one X. When you get that diopter tuned, it's like the scope doesn't even exist. There's still a subtle disruption to the image where like light is coming through the optic and bending and shaping. And it and it's not it's not as if the reticle is simply floating there. That's what that's how I try to describe it to people is that it when you look at a low power variable on one power, it's very difficult to articulate, but you can tell you're looking through something. Correct. And that you're looking you're looking at an image that's being created by the scope. Yes. That is one power. And when you look through a red dot, you're actually looking at the thing you're aiming at. Yes. But just with you're just looking at it, and then there happens to be a red dot where you're aiming. I would make the selection honestly based on personal preference. I can speak to the yeah. merits. I can speak to the merits of an LPVO in that there's a little bit more utility there. So that Tika, if I wanted to shoot it at 500 yards with a one to six on it, easy peasy. Done. Turn it to six. I actually know what my subtension values are in that reticle, on target and hammer. No sweat. Certainly, this is a little more challenging than it would be with a red dot, but we can also shoot red dots to that distance, too, if you know your zero and you know your holds, and target dimension helps. It's mm-hmm. probably having... That's where that's where eyes come into play, too, sure. a little bit. You know? Sure. But, so, I would say if, if the shooter was going to be in a situation in which a distance component would be entered into the co- equation, like, you could have that 200-plus yard shot. Magnification certainly isn't going to yeah. hurt you. If you want the lightest, least obtrusive system, and undeniably the fastest, Mm -hmm. and I'm thinking heavy cover, you may have a shot across a little bit of an ag field or a food plot, but nothing more than, like I said, 200 yards and in, and you just want something lightning fast, that will be the red dot. And it's almost more form factor than it is even speed. Sure. Well, I'm picturing your... Um, you know, your little short barrel yep. barreled Tika yep. or 16 inch Tika, maybe I shouldn't call it a short barrel. Um, it's such a petite rifle to put like an LPVO on it would like look oh, chunky. It And it feels chunky. Like, but I picture it with that uh, crossfire on there and I'm just like, oh, so European. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I think it's still a faster system and it's, and I mean, it's the original point and shoot mm-hmm. optic, right? Red dots are, we've said it before too a couple of times, they're like a specialty piece of equipment. Sure. If you have no need to zoom in, if you got a low power variable and all you would ever do is keep it on one power, don't do that, just get a red dot. Yeah. There's nothing else in the field of view besides whatever it is that we're shooting yeah. at. And a low power variable optic is really, it's, uh, it's, it's a chameleon. It can do many things yep. very well. Yep. Mm-hmm. But if you want the one thing that does close up, fast, and accurate... The and, best and lightweight and lightweight. Yeah, the best. Then it's it's the red dot. Yeah, and we and we see that too. And when, when we're doing like tactical shooting, especially speed drills, red dot shooters will be faster than LPVO shooters, um, just because there's less. I don't know what we're gonna call it translation of image going on, and it's just up, boom, done. Yep. And there's something to be said for that. Yeah. 
I like it. A little two MOA dot. We when we range cert customers crossfires and spark solars, we usually mount them up either on the Tika six five, or the Tika three hundred, and we do them at fifty yards. Mm-hmm. And we put together sub minute groups of them on the regular on sure. the on the routine. And um, it's always neat to take a two minute of angle red dot with no magnification, shooting it at fifty yards, and you come back with the proverbial one hole group. It's like that's cool. That is that's cool. fun. That is I like cool. it. Well, there you have it, folks. Done. Jim, Ryan, grab your Speedos. Grab your red dots. It's time to go shoot some does later this year. Grab your bolt rifle. I forgot that component. Oh, yeah. Because you're going to need you're that. You're pretty focused on ma- the Speedo part. Yeah, I got excited. <laughs> Jumped the gun there. Uh, what do you folks think out there? Are you putting a red dot on your bolt rifle? Does that just seem completely out of place? Or do you live in a region where it's so in place it makes the most sense. Yeah. And if you're hunting in Europe with a red dot, tell us a little about your adventures. Yeah. Because that's just cool stuff. All right. Until next time, happy hunting and shooting. Put a red dot on your bolt gun. If it makes sense, we'll catch you on the next one. 